the wrinkles in these hands tell a very, very long story. They are the dash between your birth and your final destination. Wrinkles are the rainbows. They are the metals of your life. Wrinkles glow between every sunrise and every single sunset. Getting old is just a number, and it is the privilege that many do not achieve. I leave you with a prayer based out of Psalm 71, 18. Even when I am old and gray, God, you will never, ever forsake me. In fact, you will even help me to declare your power and miracles to the next generation. And not only to my family, but I will be able to share all your mighty acts with all who are to come. That's Nana. We call her Nana Noodleman, if you've seen Sing. She's a Nana Noodleman to our kiddos. She's a great mother-in-law. And she makes these, uh, these uh, booklets. And it should be her paid job. But she makes these booklets every time uh, the year is over or there's like a wedding or a, a birth or something in our family. And she puts these uh, books together. And so I was looking through one of her books. And I saw that saying that started it. I said, can you send me this, this, uh, this saying that I loved? And it changed, just that saying changed the way I looked at aging. It said, not everybody gets to grow old. So we live in a society today that talks about age and aging as being a negative thing. And I saw that and I was like, that is so good, Nana. Not everybody gets to grow old. It's a blessing, right? It's a blessing to be another year older. We should be proud of our age and what God's brought us through. So I'm going to um, tell you about a few people here that um, were fun for me. Um, we're going to meet uh, Mr. Moore Keat. He's a World War II veteran. And he became the world's oldest bungee jumper in 2010 at the age of 96. Imagine that, pulling on your body. He didn't begin, and he didn't begin jumping until he was 88 years old. Can you imagine? I don't know a lot of 88-year-olds that would start that. Harriet Thompson, I like this one because I'm a runner, a cancer survivor. She ran her first marathon at the age of 76. And at 91 years old, she completed her 15th marathon, becoming the second oldest marathon runner in the U.S. history. Yeah. Pretty cool, huh? And then this person, Yurichiro Mura, in 2014, I'm sure that's how it's pronounced, became the oldest person to reach the top of Mount Everest at age 80. Isn't that crazy? And has said he'd like to try again at the age of 90. That's awesome. Now, I know to personalize this next one, people say all the time, including us, I feel like God's put it on our heart to write a book. So I know there's a lot of writers in here. When I say writers, you might not see yourself as a writer because you haven't written a book yet. But many of you have said to us, I just feel like God's put it on my heart to write a book. So we have many writers in here at Northbridge. Be encouraged. It's not too late. Um, Laura Ingalls Wilder began writing Little House on the Prairie at age 65, which obviously later became the beloved television series. And then we have just as many people that say God put it on your heart to start a business, right? You know who you are. So we have, by faith, many, many business owners in here. And it's not too late. Colonel Sanders, 65 years old, he started his first chain restaurant. Nine years later and 600 franchises later, he sold his share for millions. Isn't that exciting? And when I see stories like this, it makes me like, yes, that's what I want to be and that's what I want to do. I remember sitting at church one week at Mission Church and our pastor was talking about how as you get older, you're less likely to try something new. And I sat there so proud because my parents had started a business. And I was like, they kept saying, we're too old, we're too old, we're too old. And then they decided, you know, eight years later, it finally became successful. And they're like, but it's not worth it. We don't really want to work around the clock. 
And they were able to go back to Kaiser and do what he was wanting to do. And he had said a couple of times, you know, I feel like that failed. And I'm like, failed? Do you know the seeds you planted in me and my family? That at that age, you started your dream and you never said, ah, I'm this old. I'll never do that now. I'll never get to 60. I'll never get to 65 or 70 and say, ah, I'm too old. I watched my parents do it and I watched them fight for it until it became successful. And it was in their choice of now what do we want to do? We finally proved that it worked. We can do it. And it just planted amazing seeds in me to never say I'm too old for that stuff. So the heart of Northbridge, we've never really talked about it, but we knew before we launched, we're going to name our church Generations Church because we didn't want anyone to be like, oh, is that an old church or is that a young church? Because that's what people say when they want to visit a church. Is this, I think that, is this going to be dumb worship or is this going to be good worship? And so I know that people think that because I thought that. And so we were like, we're going to just by the sign, we're going to say we want people to know this is Generations Church, which to us means All generations are welcome, but we've never really said it. We've just kind of shown it by who's on the stage constantly, who's in worship, who's speaking, who's doing things, is everybody's welcome. So today is going to be the first time we're going to actually talk about it, and we're going to talk about the heart of Northbridge and how we need generations. Ben and I had told my parents for years, we're not starting a church if you're not there with us, right? Our dream was to have our parents with us. We wanted to do this with our family. We wanted to do this with people that thought like us, that believed like us, that could run with this vision like us but we wanted to do it with wisdom as well and we knew this was our wisdom and I think part of the times we find ourselves up a creek without a paddle and it's because we don't have wisdom in our lives and Ben's going to talk about that so I'm not going to talk too long but having people in your lives that are wisdom and one of the goals today is that this is the place for you. If you don't have wisdom in your life, that you can find that here at Northbridge, that you can look around and say, you know what? They've been there before me. They, if I ask them, they'll pray for me and my family faithfully. We need their prayers. We need their wisdom. We need their experience. And so if you don't have that, we want you, one of the main goals of this whole series is that we start adopting people that aren't in our family into our family. So if you're somebody that you're like, man, I'm going through a hard time and I need someone that I know has been there before and that will faithfully pray for me, that you'll find that here at Northbridge and you'll start looking for that and that we'll start looking for you knowing you might need prayer. And my last thing that I want to talk about before I hand it over because we all have something to say today is if you're like me, I spent the first 40 years of my life thinking I'm too young, I'm, I'm called to teach, I'm called to tell people about Jesus, I'm called to tell them about how much he loves them and you can get out of this. And every time I went to get on the stage, I would think nobody's going to listen to me because I'm too young which we're talking about next week. Come back next week. Nobody's going to listen to me because I'm too young. But I didn't realize the first 40 years of my life that was the enemy trying to steal from me what God had put in my heart. Then I hit 40, and I was like, now I'm too old. Nobody wants to listen to me because now I'm too old. We started youth pastoring, our second youth pastoring job. We started when we were 24. Then when we hit our second church and our last church, I was 30. My first night there, they had a party for us, and a girl walked up to me and said, you look just like my grandma. (laughs) And I looked at her, and I thought, well, your grandma must be hot, and your grandma must be young. But I said to her, because I'm feisty, and so I said, well, you look like my great-grandma. Like, I was annoyed. I'm like, who says that (laughs) to somebody? But that's the point. In this day and age, when you're 30, you're over the hill, right? You're old. And so if we listen to society, they'll tell you you're old when you're 30 years old. And so I want you to realize that this is just the enemy's ploy. If you're not feeling too old, you're feeling too young. If you're not feeling too not recovered, you're feeling too normie. Like the enemy is constantly lying to you and he's telling you something. And so we want you to stop believing the lies. And so I'm feisty and I rise up against certain things like, oh no, you're not going to steal my money. You're not going to steal my kids. And I thought, why do I care about my age then? No, I am not too old. First of all, I wasn't too young and now I'm not too old or too young for anybody. What God has put in us, it's for a reason. So John 10, 10 says the thief's thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and to destroy. My purpose, God's purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. He wants to take that from us. So here's what I wrote. He wants to steal my voice and he wants to steal my influence. And he's doing that to every single one of us here in a different way. 
you're not this enough, you're not that enough, okay? So he wants to kill my sense of purpose and my worth and my value. And that's the main thing that happens as we age. I don't have worth anymore. I don't have value anymore. Oh, it makes me angry. When people ignore someone that's older or I just think, um, excuse me, did you see them here? Still a person. Because when I get older, I don't want to be treated like all of a sudden I'm not a person anymore, right? And so let's value that next generation. Let's honor them. Let's look at them and say, man, look at the wisdom that's here. Can you share some of that with me? And then, because he wants to steal my voice, he wants to kill my sense of purpose, in turn, he's going to destroy my life, my family, and my fulfillment. And so today, we wrote like a goal for every single week of these eight weeks. And it was funny because Ben's like, okay, what's our main goal today? And I literally like listed five. I'm like, goal one that I already said, you, if you don't have someone that can be that for your life and pray for you and stand in the gap for you, we want you to find that. But we also want people who are checked out of life to get checked back in life and realize that you are still here for a purpose. And it's not a little one. You are still here for a major purpose. And if you believe that, you'll fulfill that. Um, we want you to never stop planting seeds ever. And they're going to talk about all the seeds that we're called to plant after we've been through something. And then for us, what Ben's going to talk about in Seeking Wisdom, we never want to stop seeking wisdom from those that have already been there before us. Okay, I'll stop. It's your turn. It's great. Thanks, Ben. Great. Talk about, talk about looking old. One time we were on a run and her p person who worked with her said, hey, I saw you running. It was me and Angie. A couple days later, the lady says, I saw you running with your grandpa. Not even your dad, your grandpa. She's like, oh, that was my husband? Anyways, it's my bald head, Scott. It's my bald head. All right, okay. Hey, so I just, I, I just want to talk to the fact that we need to seek wisdom and we need to look for it. Angie said one of our goals was that. Um, but oftentimes we think we know better. I, I, I can figure it out. I can watch YouTube. I could research it. I don't know if it's the man in me, but sometimes it's hard to ask for wisdom. Hard to ask for guidance because I don't know, maybe it's a show in my head. I think maybe I, I'll be less of a man if I ask Gary how to do this or if I ask somebody else, hey, how'd you do that? Uh, part of my mindset is that way. I want to show you a picture. We, um, we our kids made, Le uh, Lexi and Bodie made Angie for Mother's Day a garden. And we don't garden very much uh, ever, actually. And so we've tried. It's never worked. But this year it worked. And so... Um, it's so, it was so fun to see it this summer. We grew tomatoes, we grew carrots, we grew um, cu cucumbers, and we grew green beans. And so the furthest one, it's hard to see it exactly, but the furthest one is green beans. And half of it grew, as you can see, grew up the fence. The half in the front didn't. Now, if you look at life this way a little bit, keep that up for me if you can, that the the the, the plant that was closest to the fence used the fence to grow faster. It was healthier, it produced more vegetables, it did more for society, and it was way, way bigger and healthier because it used something that had been there before and been there a long time as a guide, as direction. And my encouragement is that we would use the wisdom of the people around us that have been there, that have done that, that have been there longer. That fence has been there for years. That was just planted, you know, in May. And it used something that knows. And let me tell you that there are people in this room that have gone before you and have done it and have been there. And if we would seek for wisdom, they would deliver. But many times people with wisdom don't give it if it's not asked for. So if you've never asked somebody for wisdom, they're probably not gonna give it to you. I know Gary doesn't come knocking down my door and start giving me all this advice about different things because he's wise. But he'll come if I ask him, hey, what do we do about this? He'll give his wisdom on it. But it has to be asked. So I wanna remind us to do things. We need to ask for wisdom and then we need to listen. We need to ask for wisdom and we need to listen. In um, Proverbs chapter 24, and verses 5 and 6, talking about we need to actually ask. Proverbs 24, 5 and 6 says, The wise are mightier than the strong, and those with knowledge grow stronger and stronger. Listen to this, verse 6. So don't go to war without wise guidance. Victory depends on having many advisors. I think we could all agree that all of us are in some kind of a war. We're in a 
emotional with our thoughts, war with the enemy trying to whisper things to us. We're, we're in a fight with him. We're in a fight culturally. How many of you know that? Why would we go to war without wisdom and guidance? It's hard being the best dad I can be, the best husband I can be. The world wants to try to put me down, but I've got to make right choices and, I, and wisdom is always better when I ask for it. Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. And then we need to ask people, we need to seek people out, but then we need to actually listen, which is another ball game. Because there have been times where I've asked people in my life what they think or how they would do it, and I'm like, eh, YouTube knows better. <laughs> or my friends know better, or I'm just smarter, and I know better. And I, that's just not w wisdom. That when we ask advice that we would say, okay, you're along. And you trust Jesus first and foremost. You trust the Holy Spirit inside of you. But if you ask a bunch of people and they all agree, you should probably listen to that advice. Proverbs 1 and verse 5 says, let the wise listen and add to their learning, and let the discerning get guidance. That if we want to be wise, that we would ask and then listen. In week one of this series, we talked about who's influencing you. Who's, who is guiding the way you make decisions? And we, we decided that scripture and the Bible is going to dis, um, guide and, and do um, and play the biggest role in our lives, not culture, not um, other voices, but is, is going to be the Bible. And I, I mentioned a story, and I kind of want to just revisit it really quick, um, of a king by the name of Rehoboam. And he was a young king, and all the people come to him and say, your dad, Solomon, was bad to us. He wasn't nice. He, he, he treated us poorly. Will you treat us better? Basically is what they ask him. And he decides to go to two different groups of people. He goes to his dad's friends, the wise counsel, and then he goes to his friends who don't have as much experience. The wise counsel says, if you listen to them and you do what's right in their eyes and you treat them well, you'll have them as loyal subjects and things will be well for you. But his stupid friends, his young people that were the same age as him, his people who, you know, the YouTube, the TikTok influencers, all those people, we look at them and they tell him, no, you should be worse than your dad. You should be meaner. And so being the wise person he is, he listens to his friends and is an idiot and treats the people worse and, and is, is harder than his dad. And this is how it plays out for him in uh, uh, 1 Kings Chapter 14, verse 23. This is the city that he was in. He was the ruler of Judah. Judah was openly wicked before God. I don't really want my family to be there. The Sharkies were openly wicked before God, making him, God, very angry. They set new records in sin, suppressing anything their ancestors did. They were worse off than the generation before them because the king didn't listen to wise counsel. And my encouragement is today that we have wise counsel up on this stage, but we have wise counsel in these seats. And like Angie said, we're going to extend our family in this series, not just going to be it starts at home, but it starts at this home. And we're going to make an influence with people around us and make this culture influential. And there's people in your life and around you that have wisdom. Ask God to ask the right person and they will be more than happy to give it to you if you offer, offer up the opportunity for them to sow seeds in your life. And that's one of the goals we have today. And Carl's going to come and share. And Carl's been sowing seeds in my life since I was born. He was my principal. And then his wife, Karen, lived with us for a while. So they've been an incredible seed giving in our life as well. So give Carl a hand as he comes up today. Thanks. Amen. How many guys heard the story of Moses? Moses was 80 years old. The story of the Bible is God uses people who you wouldn't think should be used. And Moses sees a firing bush, steps over, and he wants to see what's happening. And, he, and, and God shows up in that burning bush, and he tells him, take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. Then, he, then the next thing he asks him is, what do you have in your hand? I've got a stick. I've got my shepherd's staff. I've got my occupation. i got my gifts and talents. i got everything I have is in this stick. This is how I make my livelihood. He says, throw it on holy ground. And God asks us to throw what we have on holy ground. God can use every one of us just like he used Moses. And from that stick, 
on holy ground, he delivered a whole nation. Don't ever think that what you have is, is not valuable to God. It is. And I want to just share my little story. Um, it just, I, I, I got saved, and then I really got saved about 19 years old. <laughs> 2.0, and and uh, and so and so I went to 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 where I worked, and I says, I want to start a Bible study. I wasn't even going to church at the time, but I knew I needed to start a Bible study. So I got a couple guys at my work, and we started a Bible study, and and uh, picked up a guitar, didn't know how to play a guitar, and I and my fingers went to two two open chords. One was an E minor, and right down below was an A minor, I guess that's what it was, two, two, two fingers, two, two, you know, a, a minor, E minor. And I made a little tune out of that. And from that little tune, I started playing the guitar. Somebody, I think somebody, he gave me his guitar. So I took it home, and I, and I self-taught myself um, all the, pretty much all the open chords on the guitar. I didn't know what they were. I knew, I knew the sound, but I didn't know if it was an E minor, a, a C, or an A. But I knew I had, found, I had found notes on the guitar. That's all I knew. <laughs> so I get involved. I go to, go to church. God leads me to uh, ben, Ben's parents' church. And, uh, and I says, well, I want to work with children, I think. You know, I want to I work with children's church. So I, I go there. And they have a song sheet of the songs the children sing, and I don't know the notes. So I have to go find a, a, a chord book at the music store and find out the notes that I've been playing because I don't know what they are. And so I, I, I took what I knew, what I had, and I started making a singing to the kids in children's church. I was about 26 years old then. Um, <clears throat> Erica back there. Was, was about Alexa's age, and Bodhi is about uh, Monica's age. So that's where I started. I started, and I learned, I learned notes. I still don't know, really know how to play the guitar, but, <laughs> but I give an attempt. And, and we're gonna, next week, we're going to have a fun time. We're going to sing with the children to, to, to you guys, and we're going to enjoy a family church. Amen. Because it's all about sowing seeds. It's all about taking what you have and throwing it on holy ground and watching what God does to it. And, and there's nothing that we have that's not valuable to God. Amen? God will use our little to make much. It doesn't matter how old you are or, or anything. It's, it's all about sowing seed. And, the, and in Galatians it says, don't, don't grow weary in that. Don't grow re weary in doing well because you will reap. If you faint not, that was, that was 40 years ago for me. And now I'm singing for uh, Ben and Angie's kids. So, so it, it's, it's, it's a generational thing. Be involved with what You'll never be sorry. Getting involved, throwing it on holy ground. Amen. Now we want to hear from a great man, Scott, right here. Good morning. When, uh, when Ben asked me to talk here, he gave me the impression that I was speaking for the oldest group. So to me, that's like between Ben and going home to Jesus. So that, that, that's, that's, a, that's a big group to speak for. Uh, you know, uh, I don't even think of myself as being old. I had to check my license to make sure I was even qualified to be here. <clears throat> but uh, many of you know I, I'm not your average senior. Well, there's, there is no average senior. We're a, a very diverse group. And there's, there's, we're all over the place. But uh, with your permission, fellow seniors, I'm going to speak for the rest of us. That's okay. Just don't get mad if I make fun, okay? So we're the baby boomers. That's that population bubble that happened right after World War II starting then. But uh, we've become, over time, we've gone from the boomers to the groaners, right? <laughs> so, you know, you ask us, how are you doing today? You know, we'll spend the next 10 minutes talking about our frustrations, irritations, operations, and medications, you know. <laughs> you know, we've got, <laughs> we got more titanium, titanium and chromium in us than a new Tesla, right? In a quiet room, you can hear us standing up. <laughs> but <laughs> there's a good side to it. You know, we get senior discounts, and people generally give us grace when we're holding up the lines at Walmart or passing gas, okay? 
But uh, seriously, those are folks that talked about you know, the wisdom that we can share. And I like this word repository. And that means a safe place to store something of value that can be accessed in a time of need. So that's, that's kind of what we are. And like they said before, you know, just ask us and we'll be happy to, to give you that advice. And too often, even if you don't ask us, right? How many of you out there are retired? Okay, good, you made it. John, how many days left? <laughs> He's ready to go. Well, I've heard it said, and Ben mentioned this, that uh, we don't just retire from something, we retire to something, okay? So personally, I've done this in three diff very different careers in my life, and uh, I just wanna ask you, what have you retired from, okay? And what have you retired to? I like to think of several ways that we can be a new retirement of, of service. So if you show that up there, that's one of the ways that we can be of service. And Jesus says in uh, Matthew 25, 40, whatever you've done for the least of us, uh, for at least these my brethren, you have done for me. So we can serve God through serving others. Um, I also, I personally, I, you know, I volunteer at the food bank and I'm also a member of Liberty Lake Lions Club, and also SCOPE. You, know what, you all know what SCOPE is? Okay. Um, one of the, the best things that I've ever done in terms of service has been um, working at Kairos Prison Ministry. You wanna show that? <laughs> so, Mike, my, my, thank you, thank you. We've, we've been in uh, at least three different prisons in California and one here in Idaho. And my Kairos brothers and I, we go in and we, we kind of break the ice and we, we talk about uh, different things and, and get to know each other and we sit down at tables and we talk about things like, like uh, choices we make, what the repercussions are, and show them that there's, there's still hope no matter what they're in there serving for. And some of these, these, we call them uh, residents, they're in there for a long time, but we want to show them some, some hope when they get out there and, you know, salvation, not just that God has forgiven them, but so they can forgive themselves. So um, I've also, you know, received several letters of gratitude from some of these gentlemen. Uh, I, I did not give them my home address. It came from someplace else. Uh, but hopefully we'll see this. We'll, <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> knock, knock. <laughs> anyway, uh, hopefully we'll get something going here at Airway Heights, and then you'll see me up here asking for volunteers. Another way to plant seeds is through mentoring, okay? Uh, every senior has something they can teach a younger person. You know, maybe it's a mechanical skill like auto repair or a trade you worked in. Maybe it's an artistic talent or a sport you did or a hobby you enjoy like photography or gardening. Matt, you can teach croquet, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. Start with our own youth program, our grandkids, somebody else's grandkids, but make sure you ask first. Uh, but how about our local YMCA, the Boys and Girls Club? Uh, as an example, here's a photo of me mentoring a young pastor that you might recognize in the skill of whitewater uh, kayaking. <laughs> he survived. Uh, last but certainly not least in planting seeds is financial support. Uh, even if you're not physically able to do any of these other things, uh, there are effective Christian and secular organizations that improve young lives. For many years, I've sponsored uh, children through the Child Fund International. My current sponsorship is a young lady named Ramda uh, in India. And it, it's so cool to, to get her letters. They're, they're in Hindi, but they're translated. Uh, it's so cool to watch her growing up and her development over the years uh, through her photos and things. Now, now Janice, my wife, has been independently uh, helping young men and his family in Kenya, Africa. Uh, he sends videos of how her financial gifts have benefited them, like vegetables they grow with the seeds they bought, or the chickens they now raise. Talk about seeds, giving seeds. So that's really cool. Uh, he speaks understandable English and he always wishes us God's blessings in our generosity. So these are a few ways that all of us, not, not just anybody, not seniors, but anybody can continue to plant seeds as we grow older. Uh, there are people of any age by virtue of our individual experiences and personalities that we can reach that nobody else can. So pray that we'll recognize those opportunities and act on them. So remember, we're never too old to plant seeds because God is simply not done with us yet. Thank you. That was good, thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning. Um, 
I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach this morning because I'm going to talk about <clears throat> specific people that planted seeds in my life and how important that was to me. Um, we're all planting seeds, whether we're realizing it or not, and many times we don't even realize how important those seeds are, but they're valuable. Examples of important seeds that we can be planting and that others plant in our lives are kindness. I love that one. I could say that a million times. We don't see a lot of that anymore. Sometimes I just wish we could see more of that. But love, generosity, forgiveness, faith, and more. I'm going to share just a little bit of my testimony because I've never done that before. And so most of you don't really know that you assume I grew up in a Christian home, which kind of, kind of did, kind of didn't. But um, I want to share a little bit of that with you this morning and how, how seed planting affected me. So when I was growing up, um, I didn't have very many people in my family that planted godly seeds in my life because there weren't any Christians in my life other than my mom. My dad was not a Christian. My brother was not a Christian. My aunts and uncles were not Christians. My grandparents were not Christians. They were alcoholics, and they did not prioritize family at all, so we rarely saw them. So we didn't have much family but God. But God, God always meets our needs. And he put people in my life all along the way that could plant seeds for us. We had a wonderful guy in our church that always made sure Gary and I um, participated in the youth group activities, even though the rest of the older ones didn't want us to be able to participate. They would say, Gary and Barbie Annie or Barbie Ann are just too little. And he would, and I, we would just get deflated and think we couldn't. And then he would say, they can ride with me. He was planting seeds. He probably never even knew the importance of it. Had he not done that, though, we may never have been connected there. We may never have even known God. Because knowing and hearing what older people said about us, we might not have wanted to have anything to do with that. So he touched our hearts, and he made us feel special, wanted, and that we belonged. He still holds a huge place in our heart, and he means a lot to us. Then when my mom was pregnant with me and my brother was only two years old, my dad had a tragic on-the-job accident that left him paralyzed, and my mom needed to go to work. And so people from the church stepped up, and they helped to do the things that my dad couldn't do. They were planting seeds, and I'm sure, they, again, they never really fully realized how much that they did for us and how important those seed plantings were for us. One of those very special men that did that was named Delmer. He would come over to our house Anytime we needed anything that my dad couldn't do, even after maybe a long, hard day at work or his day off, he would come. His wife, Marie, was our wedding planner. She helped with tons of things when Matt was born because I was a new mom and wasn't the greatest. <laughs> Nervous, I would say. And she also babysat our kids whenever we needed. Again, they were planting seeds in our life. Delmer and Marie meant a lot to Gary and me all through our lives. Marie... Um, just passed away in April of this year. And Delmer passed away four months later in August, just two months ago. And I would visit them often while they were in their, while they're still in their home, and then once they put them into a care facility, I visited them often. I did it because I loved them, and I did it because I wanted to plant seeds for them like they had done for me, but they were still planting seeds. Do you have Psalms 92, 12 through 4? But the godly will flourish like palm trees and grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon. 13. For they are transplanted to the Lord's house. They flourish in the forts of, courts of God. And 14. Even in old age, and they still will bear fruit, and they will remain vital and green. That's what they did. They just, they just kept getting older, and they just kept planting more seeds. It's pretty phenomenal. We're blessed to know them. But they were planting seeds. So Marie um, was 95 when she passed away this April. Delmer was 99 when he passed away in August. And they would have been married 80 years this December. And clear to the end, they were planting seeds. I would ask Delmer. I would interview him. I would go and I would say, I want to interview you today. Can I interview you? Oh, yes, he'd say. And I would say, can I write it all down? Yes, you can. So I would ask my, my questions and um, interview him. 
And one day I asked him about his faith and his unwavering trust in God. And and um, I asked him about about that. How 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 that was that, and his answer was, um, where is it? I, or it ha- he said, sometimes I have doubted. I have never doubted God. He said, but sometimes I've wondered about certain things. But he said, you know what? I've always chosen to trust God. I've never, I've never given up on on trusting God. I keep my hope and my trust in him. And then he quoted my favorite scripture by heart at, at that age, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which, which says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways and he will direct your paths. What a precious thing. That's what he was standing on too. And I love that. And he said he never doubted God. And I, sti- I still remember that. That was a little over a year ago. And that was just precious. He loved to sing to me, too. I'd always ask him if he would sing to me, and he said, of course he would. And so he would sing. And I brought a clip today of him singing on one of those special day- days. Delmer is 98 here. Marie's 94. And they're still planting seeds. This is an old hymn. Some of you may not recognize it, but some of you may. He's singing, and she's singing along. Listen to the words, as I'm sure that they're going to plant seeds in your heart today, too. Do you have that video? I am going to a city where the streets with gold are laid, where the tree of life is blooming and the roses never fade. Here they bloom, but for a season, soon their beauty is decayed. But I am going to a city where the roses never fade. Uh, that he, he was always welcome. Beep. He was always willing to do that for me. And he was 98, and he died just a year later there. But we're all planting seeds. We're never too old to plant seeds. And oftentimes, we don't even realize that we are planting seeds. So let's make sure we're planting good ones. Isaiah 40, 31 says, but those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar with, on high with wings of eagles. They will run and not grow weary, and they will walk and not faint. And that's a promise to all of us, and all of us that are growing older, too. It's a promise to us. We can count on God to give us the strength we need to live long, healthy lives and to continue to plant good seeds until the day we die, just like Delmer and Marie did. Amen. I get to land this plane. (laughs) I haven't flown very many times. Don't worry. God is good, isn't he? Good to see you all. I think I want to start with... um, when we were younger, um, we didn't have a whole lot of money because we were in the ministry. And so um, our trips were to go to Canada because I think back then you could get quite a bit exchanged for your American dollar. <laughs> It'd go quite a long ways. And so we would uh, take our family um, to Canada and enjoy the different things in Canada. and. And so anyway, uh, we always stopped at a church if we were there on a Sunday. And I don't remember why, but this was a Sunday evening. I don't know if we missed out and weren't able to go to church um, because um, we were busy in the morning or what. But we went to this church. We were invited, and it was in the evening. And I'll never forget what this elderly gentleman said. I think he was 90 years old, and so they asked him to stand up, and we, of course, we don't know who these people are, and they said, uh, tell us what your key is, what, what you've learned through all these years. 
And the one thing that really stuck with me through all of these years was he said, oftentimes when things get hard, we want to quit. And he said, let me tell you, things are going to get hard. He said, we want to quit on our families. Husbands and wives think it's for the best of the kids that we part ways because we're fighting all the time. And so we don't want our kids to have to live in fighting all the time. And he said, friends, that's a lie. You need to work things out with one another. It is not best to separate and go your own ways for the benefit of the kids. If it's for the benefit of the kids, you will work it out and you will stay together. I'll never forget that. Through all the hard times in our lives and in our marriage, I always remembered that. This isn't the time to give up. It isn't the time to quit. I'm not quite 90. <laughs> but my advice that Barb and I have practiced through the years is gratitude and thankfulness. Gratitude and thankfulness. It's kind of hard to be angry if you're thankful. Isn't it? You might have some things about your spouse or your kids that drive you up a tree or push your buttons or whatever it might be. But I'm here to tell you, if you're thankful for those things in your spouse, your kids, whatever the person is in your life, relationships, if you're thankful, it's real hard to be angry and mad. Real hard. We constantly let each other know how thankful we are for the little things. The little things, friends. You're planting seeds in your family's hearts and lives by just being thankful. It's hard to be worrisome also if we're thankful. As we're thankful and we have gratitude for what God is doing in our lives, even if it's the smallest of things, let me tell you, you'll find more and more. Maybe you need to have a journal of thankfulness. As you do, you might find that all those worries and problems and angers will leave. So I want to encourage you that. That was not what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> you are important. There's only one you. Think about that. Your face, your features, your voice, your style, your background, your characteristics, your abilities, your smile, your walk, your handshake, your manner of expression, your viewpoint, everything about you is found only in you. Only in you. And by the way, that didn't just happen. It was planned that way. There's no other you in this world. So you are important. There's only one you, and you are you. In Psalms 139, I want to read to you in verse 13, it says, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous, how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion as I was woven together in the dark of the womb, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. 
David understood that he was unique. That God had made him and prescribed and presented him to the world and that he had a purpose. I want to encourage you this morning that we all have a purpose. It may not be to get in front of people. It may not be what you might look at somebody else and their purpose and what they're doing in life. But each and every one of us has a purpose. I know personally I am blessed by so many of you. And you probably don't even know why. But I am. Because you're unique. Remember that. We have an impact on this world. I want to encourage you, don't live on autopilot. Use your unique gifts to share with the world and make it a better place. They're not looking for our opinions. We're all full of them. But they are looking for our wisdom and our knowledge. That's what we need to impart. I know we're taught in retirement to plan for our financial future, and that's what we're going to have here shortly. But I believe we need to plan for purpose and passion, that we're con contributing, we're belonging, we have relationships, we're loving, we're helping, we're doing. And I encourage you that you have purpose, and in that purpose in your life, that you're bringing glory to God. Amen. Amen. I want to finish with this scripture in 2 Corinthians. We'll come in for a soft landing here. In verse 16, it says, That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. Renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will last forever. Amen. I'd like to pray with you this morning. I want to encourage you that you are valuable. If you've listened to the enemy and he's told you that you aren't, you let him know that's not true. God has created you and you are valuable. You are unique. You are the only you in this room. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father,